on the 8th of June, the USS Liberty had been attacked. It was no enemy that tried to sink the Liberty. It was America's ally, Israel. The survivors have always said the attack was no accident. If it was an accident, it was the best planned accident I've ever heard of. The Liberty was an unarmed ship designed to listen in on electronic communications and pass intelligence on to the highest levels of the US government. NSA, the National Security Agency, is America's top secret organization for handling electronic intelligence. From its headquarters outside Washington, it controlled the Liberty as she cruised slowly along the west coast of Africa. Her commander, William L. McGonagall, had been in the Navy since World War II. The crew included highly trained code breakers and radio experts. In a sudden change of mission, the ship was ordered to head for the Middle East. Five thousand miles away in Washington, Israel's hardline spy master, Meir Amit, was making a secret visit to his friends in the CIA and the Pentagon. Amit's key meeting was with Robert McNamara, the US Secretary of Defense. Amit wanted to know whether the Americans would back Israel if it struck the first blow. Absolutely not. Because at that point, uh, President Johnson and I and Dean Rusk had fully agreed that we must keep the US in a position where if Israel called on us for military assistance to turn back the attack by by Egypt and possibly turn back an attack uh, by Egypt with the support of the Soviet Union, we had to be in a position that we could obtain the support of the American people and the Congress for applying military force in support of Israel. And we would not have that support if Israel had attacked Egypt. So our position was, no, don't initiate the attack. And I Early on the morning of Monday, the 5th of June, Israel went to war. Its planes pounded airfields in Sinai and the Suez Canal zone, destroying most of Egypt's air force. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was boosting its military presence near the war zone. It moved 20 warships into the eastern Mediterranean. In response, the Pentagon ordered the 6th Fleet to keep all aircraft and ships at least 100 miles away from the coast. But one vessel received no such message. The USS Liberty steamed on towards the Sinai coast. Thursday, the 8th of June, dawned fine and clear. But the war was still raging, and Israeli planes flew out from the Sinai Peninsula to check on the Liberty. The Israeli aircraft seemed to be identifying the ship as belonging to their ally, America. Confident that the Israelis knew who they were, the Liberty men relaxed. A new flag was flying, visibility was perfect, and they'd received no orders to leave the area. That sense of security was about to be brutally shattered. At two o'clock in the afternoon, the officers on the bridge spotted three Delta Wing Mirage jets. The decks above were being shredded. The attempts to send an SOS message failed. The Liberty's frequencies were being jammed. The attackers knew their target, but they were keeping their own identity well hidden. At the end of the air attack, eight men were dead and 75 injured. But the worst was yet to come. Down below the waterline, the men in the engine room got ready to die. It hit. The Liberty was now paralyzed. Her power and steering control lost. But her desperate SOS message had been picked up by the American 6th Fleet, 500 miles away off Crete. Retaliation was ordered for the attack. On the USS America, two bombers were readied while their fighter escort was launched. Condition November meant that nuclear-armed A-4 bombers were to be used. Incredibly, the U.S. was about to launch a nuclear strike against Egypt, the Liberty's presumed attacker. Uh. Cairo was about to be incinerated. 
the U.S. Embassy was told that an attack was coming. The Navy was uh, preparing to retaliate against Egypt for the attack on the Liberty. A few minutes later, Tony Hart passed a Pentagon message through to the Navy, recalled the aircraft. About 10 minutes later, the USS America and Washington were connected by voice link. The Defense Secretary himself came on the line. The attack on the Liberty had triggered an extraordinary response. Nuclear armed planes had been on their way to Cairo. A nuclear strike had been minutes away and had only just been averted. But it seems McNamara was also unwilling to send aircraft directly to help the Liberty. The fleet commander asked for permission to send a rescue flight of conventionally armed aircraft. The Admiral was talking to McNamara and asking for permission to relaunch the ready aircraft, relaunch any aircraft. And McNamara said no, that no aircraft were to be launched. McNamara is the boss, you know, he doesn't have to explain why he says what he says. I'm Admiral Larry Geis, the commander of Task Force 60. He was very upset. He said, told me he knew it was going to be hushed up, and I wasn't to say anything about it, but he had to get it off his chest. That he had sent aircraft and notified Washington obviously via the Criticom network because it got to Bob McNamara and Lyndon Johnson and he got, had the aircraft recalled by Robert McNamara. So he said he reconfigured a flight of aircraft with aircraft incapable of carrying nuclear weaponry and relaunched it. He again notified Washington. Again, Robert McNamara ordered the aircraft recalled. He challenged the order and Lyndon Johnson came on. He said he didn't give a damn if the ship sunk. He would not embarrass his allies. While the 6th Fleet was launching and recalling its aircraft, the Liberty was still under attack by the Israeli torpedo boats. We basically were dead in the water. The word came down, prepare to abandon ship. That meant prepare only, go up and get, get ready, get near the life rafts. Well, I went up first, popped the hatch, looked out for the life rafts. They were either gone or burning. And at the same moment, I looked to the stern of the ship and I saw one of the torpedo boats methodically machine gunning one of our life rafts that had floated back. We cut the life rafts loose because they were burning or had, had been damaged. And they floated back behind us and he was machine gunning the life raft. And I knew that had there been anyone in there, they certainly wouldn't be alive. The assault was over, but the cover-up was about to begin. Israel admits the reconnaissance planes had identified the Liberty during the morning. The Air Force notified Naval HQ in Haifa, where the ship's position was marked on a combat information map. Later that morning, Navy HQ received reports of the Sinai coast being shelled from the sea. But by this time, say the Israelis, the Liberty had been erased from their naval map. When the patrol boats went to find the source of the alleged shelling, the only ship they found there was the Liberty. And so the Air Force was summoned to catch the fast-moving target. Then, says Israel, the sailors made another fatal mistake, confusing the ship with the El Khuzair, an Egyptian transport vessel half the Liberty's size. But the evidence points to Israel knowing the ship's identity and wanting it sunk fast. That the attack was intended to be blamed on Egypt and would therefore draw America into the war and was carried out with the foreknowledge of certain people in Washington. The Liberty's captain had always suspected this was the case. In 1997, at Arlington Cemetery, he broke his 30-year silence. For many years, I had wanted to believe that the attack on the Liberty was pure error. It appears to me that it was not a pure case of mistaken identity. I think that it's about time that the State of Israel and the United States government provide the crew members of the Liberty and the rest of the American people the facts of 
what happened and why it came about that the liberty was attacked 30 years ago today. Less than two years later, McGonagall himself would be buried at Arlington. Shortly before he died, he sent an open letter to President Clinton calling for Israel to acknowledge publicly that her armed forces had deliberately attacked. We found evidence that this was part of a larger plan hatched by Israeli and American intelligence to invade Egypt and overthrow Nasser, a plan codenamed Cyanide. The 303 Committee was a secret group that used to meet at the old executive office building round the corner from the White House. Here, in April 1967, the committee met to discuss a sensitive Defense Department project. It would involve the Liberty with a highly risky submarine operation to help Israel. Scribbled on the minutes is a note. Submarine within UAR waters. Another term for Egypt. What connection could this mysterious submarine have had with the Liberty? And why was it being discussed a full two months in advance of the war? The operation is still so sensitive that we could get no comment from US or Israeli intelligence. This covert operation was also part of Cyanide. Before the war, the team had secretly been sent to an Israeli air base in the Negev desert. The men wore unmarked uniforms and had no ID, while four American reconnaissance planes were disguised as Israeli. They can deny it now. Fine. Take a look at the reconnaissance information that the Israelis have that was published publicly in Time magazine, Life magazine, I think Look magazine. That was our work. The Israelis had no reconnaissance aircraft and you can't get the detail off of gun cameras that, that was in those films. If it's true that America was secretly in the war against Egypt, this had to be kept quiet at all costs. Whatever lies behind the attack, the human tragedy was that 34 young men were dead. Most were killed below decks, and their remains could only be removed when the Liberty finally arrived at Malta. In Malta, meanwhile, the Liberty men were alarmed by the way Admiral Kidd was steering the naval inquiry. He seemed to have made up his mind in advance and was ignoring crucial evidence. The report was reviewed at the Navy's European headquarters by Merlin Starring, later the Navy's top lawyer. It didn't appear to support Kidd's conclusion that Israel had attacked in error. But a presidential election was coming up. Nobody in power wanted to let questions about the USS Liberty spoil relations with victorious Israel. In Israel, it was soon business as usual. An inquiry attended by the Navy chief, Shlomo Arel, concluded that the attack was mainly due to a series of Israeli blunders. Despite this, nobody was charged or court-martialed. The men had been ordered never to talk about the attack and the threat of court-martial. Now the Navy scattered them, and no two were posted together. Well, certainly, uh, I think it was uh, the, the way that the, the Navy and the White House handled this was a travesty. Uh, Johnson didn't want this thing publicized. Uh, he thought it would uh, uh, harm relations with Israel and his relations with, uh, with Jews in the United States. Today, even after 35 years, the Liberty incident remains so sensitive that the US Navy refuses to comment on it. I am not saying anything about the liberty, period. Israel today still occupies the conquered Palestinian territories, thanks to continued U.S. support. The war of only six days has left a painful legacy of suspicion, suffering, and sorrow. Among those living with that legacy are the liberty survivors, bitter about their own government's cover-up 